I have something amazing to tell you about the mobile game I previously recommended to you. Raid Shadow Legends Special Tournament is happening globally right now. If you join the game, you could compete against myself and millions of other players in a massive arena tournament where you can win crazy in-game prizes and even physical prizes that will get delivered straight to the winner's homes. Just a reminder for those of you who somehow missed it, Raid is a brand new free to play mobile RPG game with the most amazing storyline, awesome 3D graphics, giant boss fights, PvP battles, and hundreds of champions to collect and customize. If you haven't downloaded the game already, good news, this is absolutely the best time to join the action. Go to the description box below the video and download Raid only through my link to get 50,000 silver immediately plus a free epic champion and you'll also automatically enter the special launch tournament right away. So please support my channel today and download Raid Shadow Legends. Number 3 Miriam Rice Miriam Pacha was born in March 1960 in Mackinac City, Michigan. Her family was already pretty large when she was born. She had seven older siblings. Eventually, her parents would go on to have six daughters and seven sons. After high school, Miriam attended Aquinas College in Grand Rapids, Michigan. That's where she met Jeff Rice, who worked at the college as a resident assistant. They started dating, and then they got married in 1981, when Miriam was 21. After Miriam graduated from college, she worked as an elementary school teacher. In 1986, Miriam gave birth to a son named James. Shortly after Miriam gave birth, Jeff got a job at Notre Dame, and the young family relocated to South Bend, Indiana. In South Bend, Miriam taught aerobics and sold Mary Kay cosmetics. She also volunteered with the Special Olympics. In early 1988, Miriam found out that she was pregnant. To stay in shape while she was pregnant, Miriam often went out for walks. On the evening of June 24, 1988, Miriam, who was 28 years old and 4 months pregnant, left the family's home to take their dog for a walk. When she didn't return after an hour, Jeff became worried. He called the police and reported her missing that night. Then he called Miriam's family in Michigan and his own family, who lived in Ohio. The next morning, the dog was found hiding under a car about five blocks from Miriam's home. But there was no trace of Miriam. In the days after Miriam went missing, her family came to South Bend to look for her. On June 29th, five days after she went missing, a young man who was engaged to Miriam's sister found Miriam's body. It was on the north bank of Pinhook Lagoon, about three miles from her home. She had died from blunt force trauma to the head. It was thought that she might have been killed with a baseball bat. It was clear she had been killed elsewhere, and that her body was dragged to the banks of the lagoon. The police thought that her killer came upon her as she was walking and forced her into his or her vehicle. She had not been sexually assaulted. The police's first suspect was Miriam's husband, Jeff. He took a polygraph test and he denied having anything to do with Miriam's murder. The polygraph administrator determined that he was telling the truth. However, he remained a suspect. Miriam's sister talked to the police and she said that Miriam had told her that she and Jeff weren't getting along. Some of Miriam's family members were also suspicious of Jeff because they thought that he and Miriam's friend, who babysat for them, might have been having an affair. 
Two years and one month after Miriam's murder, Jeff and the woman got married. Miriam's family also noticed other oddities. For example, a week after Miriam went missing, Jeff had the carpets in their home professionally cleaned. Jeff claimed he was innocent and the police couldn't find anything to tie him to the murder, so he was never charged. But a cloud of suspicion hung over him. Jeff, his new wife, and the son he had with Miriam ended up moving to an area near Columbus, Ohio. Jeff and his second wife went on to have two children together. As the decades went on, it seemed like Marion Rice's murder would be one of those cases that never gets solved. Then in March 2016, 28 years after Marion was killed, the police in South Bend got an unexpected phone call from a 77-year-old man named George Kearney. At the time, Kearney was serving a 40-year sentence for molestation. He started serving his sentence in 1988. Kearney told the police he had been receiving letters from a woman named Paula Brooks. Paula was the daughter of his former girlfriend, Barbara Brewster. Kearney said that the letters accused him of killing Miriam Rice. He told the police he wanted to clear the air about Miriam's murder. Kearney said that his former girlfriend, Barbara Brewster, killed Miriam and he was there when it happened. But he denied hurting Miriam himself. After talking to Kearney, investigators spoke with a woman named Helen Patron. Patron told the investigators a rather disturbing story. She said that the day after Miriam went missing, her sister, Barbara Brewster, dropped off her daughter Paula who was seven years old at the time. Patrick noticed that her niece was upset about something. Paula told her that her mother and Kearney had taken her, her six-year-old brother, Robert, and their two-year-old brother camping in Pinhook Park. At some point in the evening, Kearney and Brewster took Robert to go get food. Paula said she was left at the campsite to babysit her two-year-old brother. Sometime after they left, Paula heard a woman's blood-curling scream. This was followed by screams of a woman pleading for her life. Then it went quiet again. Paula said that a short time later, her mother, Kearney, and her six-year-old brother, Robert, returned to the campsite. They were all splattered with blood. They burned their clothes, and Paula said she was forced to clean blood out of the van. After burning the clothes and cleaning up the van, they all left Pinhook Park. Patron said at first she wasn't sure what to think of the horrifying story that her niece had told her. But then hours later, she saw that Miriam Rice had been reported missing. So Patron called Crime Stoppers and relayed the story that Paula had told her. But no one from the police department got in contact with her. Then when she heard that Miriam's body had been found, she called Crime Stoppers again. But once again, she heard nothing from the police. Patron assumed that they didn't believe her because of Paula's age. Brewster ended up leaving Robert and Paula with Patron. Patron said she didn't see Brewster for 14 years after she left her kids with her. Patron raised both of them, and it was apparent to her that Robert was deeply traumatized by that night. But he refused to ever talk about it. After talking with Patron, the investigators tracked down Robert and Paula, who were both in their 30s. Paula confirmed what her aunt told them. 
She said she was babysitting at the campsite and suddenly the quiet of the night was shattered by a horrifying scream. She then heard a woman pleading for her life. After her mother, her mother's boyfriend, and her brother returned to the campsite, they burned their blood splattered clothes and they cleaned the van. When the police got in contact with Robert, at first, he didn't want to talk about that night. But then, he finally opened up. He said he was six years old and he was in the van with his mother and Kearney. They happened upon Miriam Rice, who was running with her dog. Robert said that Kearney got out of the van and he grabbed Miriam by the hair. She tried to fight him off, so he slammed her head into the side of the van. Kearney then got her into the back of the van. Kearney then told Robert's mother to kill her. So Brewster beat Miriam in the head with various tools that were in the van. Robert said he watched the entire murder. In July 2018, two years after George Kearney first talked to the police, he and his former girlfriend, Barbara Brewster, were arrested. At the time, Brewster was 56 years old and she was living in Weaver, Alabama. After the arrests were announced, the police told the press that at the time of Miriam's murder, Kearney and Brewster were on probation. They were both supposedly questioned about Miriam's murder by their probation officers. The police also said that they were aware of Helen Patron's phone calls to Crime Stoppers. They said they did not look into it because they received many tips that led them in many different directions. So while Kearney and Brewster were on the police's radar, they were not considered prime suspects. After they were arrested, both Kearney and Brewster pleaded not guilty. And in March 2019, Kearney changed his plea to guilty. He was looking at a sentence of 60 years in prison. But Kearney had lung cancer and he died in prison on March 24th, just weeks after pleading guilty. Barbara Brewster is expected to go to trial in June 2019. She is planning on pleading not guilty. She claims that Kearney was the one who killed Miriam Rice and not her. Number 2. The Wells Grace Provincial Park Murders In the early 1980s, George Bentley of Port Coquitlam, British Columbia had a heart attack. George, who was in his 60s, decided it was time to retire from his job at a lumber mill. He and his wife, Edith, bought a pickup truck that was fitted with a camper. They planned to tour the southern United States during the winters and stay in British Columbia during the summers. In the spring of 1982, they made plans to go camping in the summer with their daughter, 40-year-old Jackie Johnson, her husband, 44-year-old Bob, and their children, 13-year-old Janet and 11-year-old Karen. At the beginning of August, Jackie, Bob, Janet, and Karen left their home in Kelowna, British Columbia, and they traveled to Wells Gray Provincial Park. Wells Gray is a 1.3 million acre park located in south central British Columbia. The park has several mountain peaks and 39 waterfalls. The three generations of family were camping in an isolated area but none of them were worried about it. They were all experienced campers. Bob Johnson worked at a lumber mill and he was due back at work on August 16th. When Bob didn't show up for work on August 16th, his co-workers thought it was odd. Bob had worked at the lumber mill for 20 years and he had an impeccable attendance record. 
So when his co-workers had not heard from him by August 18th, they were worried about him. On August 22nd, a hiker found the shell of a burnt out car off an isolated road in Wells Gray Provincial Park. He didn't think much of it when he saw it. He just assumed it was stolen, and then whoever stole it torched it to hide any evidence that they may have left behind. The day after the burnt out car was found, Bob's co-workers reported him missing. Bob should have reported to work exactly a week earlier, and there was no sign of him or his family at their home. A major problem for investigators was that at the time the Bentleys and the Johnsons disappeared, there was a labor dispute at the park, so no one was keeping visitor records. They learned that George and Edith Bentley had signed in on August 3rd, which was the last day the park employees worked before going off the job. But after that, the police had no idea where the Bentleys and the Johnsons might be. Since the park was massive, they had no idea where to begin searching. News of the missing family was featured on local news programs and in newspapers. After learning the family was missing, the hiker who saw the burnt out car called the Royal Canadian Mounted Police, also known as the RCMP. But they didn't pay any attention to the info he gave them. In fact, the hiker thought that the officer he talked to was rather rude. A month later, the family still had not been found. Then on September 13th, the hiker was talking to his friend, who was a police officer with the Chilliwack Police Department. The hiker told his friend that he had called the RCMP and told them about the burnt out car, but they weren't receptive to him. His friend thought that what he found was worth investigating, and he called the RCMP himself. An officer with the RCMP picked up the hiker, and he led them to the burnt out car shell. The burnt out car was a Dodge Caravel, which was the type of car the Johnsons drove. In the back seat of the car, there were the charred bone fragments of four adults. In the trunk, they found bone fragments belonging to two girls. It was immediately obvious to the RCMP they had found George and Edith Bentley and Bob, Jackie, Janet, and Karen Johnson. Because of the condition of the remains, the police didn't even know for certain how the family was killed. In one of the skulls, they found what looked like a bullet hole. Bullet fragments were also found in the car. So the RCMP assumed that they had all been shot. The RCMP continued to search for the Bentley's truck, which had a camper affixed to the bed of it. Their hope was that it would hold some clues as to who killed the family. Months went by and tips continued to pour in. A waitress in British Columbia told the RCMP that she was sure she saw the truck and it was in the possession of two men. She said that the men had French Canadian accents. The RCMP received over 300 tips from people who said that they saw the Bentley's truck heading east. The RCMP thought that the men were heading to Quebec, which is the province where French is predominantly spoken. By May 1983, about nine months after the murders, the case was cold and the Bentley's truck still had not been found. The RCMP was desperate for answers, so they decided to buy the same model Ford truck as the Bentley's and affix a replica camper to the bed of it. They attached posters to the camper that appealed for information on the murders and the whereabouts of the truck. Then two officers started driving the truck east. More tips came in, but the police still couldn't find the Bentley's truck. 
the first anniversary of the mass murder passed, and no new solid leads had emerged. Then, on October 19, 1983, two forestry workers were inspecting the soil on a logging road after a forest fire. They were just over a mile away from where the remains were found 13 months earlier. Hidden in some dense brush, they saw the burnt out shell of a pickup truck with a camper attached to the bed of it. They immediately contacted the RCMP. The only thing on the truck that wasn't damaged by the fire was the license plate. So immediately, the RCMP knew that the forestry workers had found the Bentley's truck. After the truck was found, the RCMP began to suspect that the killer or killers were local. The RCMP thought that only locals would have been familiar with the area where the truck was found. The RCMP thought that the killer or killers possibly lived in Clearwater, British Columbia, which is the town closest to the murder site. So they started interviewing the residents of Clearwater. One man's statements caught the attention of the investigators. The man told the officer that was interviewing him that in late summer or early fall of the previous year, a man named David Shearing had asked some questions about registering a camper. The man said that by the way Shearing was talking, he thought that the camper had been stolen. The man also recalled that Shearing had asked him about fixing a hole in the door of a Ford truck. The man said he suspected that the hole was made by a bullet. The statement about the hole in the door convinced the officer conducting the interview that they needed to talk to David Shearing because the Bentley's truck did have a bullet hole in the door, but that information had never been made public. The police tracked down Shearing, who was then living near Dawson Creek, British Columbia, which was over 500 miles away from Clearwater. At the time of the murder, Shearing was 23 years old and he was living with his mother in Clearwater. He was a shy loner who was awkward in social interactions. In the two years before the murders, Shearing had suffered several tragedies. Shearing didn't date much, but in 1980, he was dating a young woman and things were going well. But then a month after their first date, she was killed in a car accident. Several months later, Shearing was at a party. After the party, he was driving two people home when suddenly they came across a teenage boy lying in the road. Shearing couldn't stop in time and he ran over the teenager. Shearing and his passengers didn't report the incident. The police investigated the teenager's death and their investigation led to Shearing. The police decided not to press charges against him because the teenager was drunk and had passed out on the road. Then, less than two years later, Shearing's father died unexpectedly. After his father's death, Shearing started to drink excessively. Several months after his father died, the Bentleys and the Johnsons were wiped out. On November 19, 1983, Shearing was brought in for questioning. After a 10-hour interrogation, he was charged with six counts of second-degree murder. He then confessed to the six murders. He said that he had been suffering from insomnia. When he couldn't sleep, he went for walks. That's when he came across the Johnsons and the Bentleys. He said that on the first night, he watched them from a distance without them knowing he was there. The next night, he went back and watched them again. He saw them put the two girls to bed in a tent and then the four adults sat around the campfire. 
Shearing said he got close to them by hiding behind the camper. He said that from where he was standing, all the adults were easy targets. He aimed his rifle at Bob Johnson and then he shot him in the throat. After the first shot, George Bentley, his wife Edith, and his daughter Jackie scattered. Shearing said that he picked them off one by one. He then opened up the tent where Janet and Karen were sleeping and he shot them as well. After killing everyone, he hung out at the campsite and drank some beer. Then he loaded the bodies into the car. He then left the campsite. He said that he came back a few days later and drove the car to the spot where it was later found. He poured gasoline onto it and set it ablaze. He went back to the campsite the next night and he moved the Bentley's truck. He then torched it as well. Shearing was repeatedly asked why did he kill them. Nearly every time he said he didn't know. One time when he was asked he said he thought it was because he wanted to steal the Bentley's truck. But then after that he went back to saying he didn't know. Shearing pleaded guilty to all six counts of second degree murder. In April 1984, he was sentenced to six concurrent life sentences without the chance of parole for 25 years. After Shearing was sentenced, the lead detective on the case visited Shearing in prison and asked him why he killed the six family members. The detective said the motive of stealing the Bentley's truck didn't make much sense. Shearing apparently told him he didn't kill the girls right away. He supposedly kept them captive and sexually abused them. He said he didn't remember exactly how long he kept them, but he said it could have been over a week. The Wells Gray's Provincial Park Murders was one of the most expensive investigations in Canadian history. Many people were critical of the RCMP about how much time and resources were put into looking for the Bentley's truck, which ultimately led to the break in the case. The RCMP thought that the truck was thousands of miles across the country when it was really just over a mile from where the remains were found. The RCMP contended that they had over 300 leads that led them to think that the truck was either heading to or already was in Ontario or Quebec. While he was in prison, David Shearing changed his last name to Innes. In 2008, Innes became eligible for parole. He was ultimately denied parole. He was able to apply again in 2014, but he waived his right. In 2018, he waived his right to apply again. He'll be able to apply for parole again in 2021 when he's 62 years old. Number 1. Susie Yeager In early summer 1973, Marietta and William Yeager were living in Farmington, Michigan. They had five children together. For nearly a year, they had been planning what they considered the family vacation of a lifetime. They were going to take their children camping for a month in Montana. Their first stop was a campground just outside of Three Forks, Montana. On the night of June 23rd, the family went to sleep in their tents. At 2.30 in the morning, the Yeager's three daughters were awoken by the sound of a train whistle. They chatted for a few minutes, but then went back to sleep. Just two hours later, one of the family members noticed that seven-year-old Susie was missing. Beside her empty sleeping bag, there was a circular slash in the tent. 
a massive search, which included dogs and helicopters, was conducted, but no trace of Susie was found. Three days after she went missing, the FBI field office in Denver, Colorado received a phone call. The caller said that he had Susie and he demanded a ransom of $25,000. But he did not give any instructions on how to get him the money. Nor did he provide any evidence that Susie was alive. Five days after that, the sheriff's office in Three Forks received a call from the same man. This time, he demanded $50,000. But once again, he gave no instructions on how to get him the money, and he offered no proof of life. In 1972, FBI agents Patrick Mullaney and Howard Tedden established the Behavioral Science Unit. A significant part of the unit was to utilize a new investigation strategy called offender profiling. Mulaney and Ten worked with two other agents to develop a profile of Susie's kidnapper. The other agents were Pete Dunbar, who was an agent stationed in Bozeman, Montana, and Robert Ressler, who would go on to be an essential figure in the Behavioral Science Unit. They thought that the kidnapper was a white man who was most likely in his 20s and he was probably a loner. He was organized and had average intelligence or above average intelligence. They also thought that Susie was most likely dead and the killer probably kept a souvenir to remind him of Susie. In the early days of the investigation, the FBI received a tip that a 23-year-old building contractor named David Meyerhofer may have been involved in Susie's kidnapping. The man who called in the tip said that Meyerhofer had acted strangely around his own children. Meyerhofer was a former Marine who had served in Vietnam. He lived in Manhattan, Montana, which is a small town a little over 10 miles from the campground. At the time, the population of Manhattan was about 900 people. Meyerhofer was a near-perfect match to the FBI's profile. The problem for the FBI was that their profile was not evidence that Meyerhofer had done anything wrong. Meyerhofer was an upstanding citizen. The former Marine did not have a criminal record, but he was involved in community activities in Manhattan so the FBI did not have probable cause to search his home or arrest him. Seven and a half months later, no trace of Susie had been found. Then another female went missing a short distance from the campground. Sandra Spolligan was 19 years old and she lived in Manhattan where she worked as a waitress. On the night of February 8, 1974, Smalligan went to the American Legion Clubhouse in Manhattan. She was last seen walking to her apartment, which was about 30 feet from the clubhouse. Her father reported her missing three days later. Her car was also missing. The police looked in her apartment and there were no signs of a struggle. A week after Smalligan went missing, an investigator was searching an area north of Manhattan called the Horseshoe Hills. The area was about 12 miles away from the campsite where Susie went missing seven and a half months earlier. The investigator came upon an abandoned ranch and he found a pair of women's underwear hanging from a fence. The investigator went into the barn that was on the property and he found Smalligan's car. He continued to look around the abandoned property and he found two fire pits. In the fire pits were the burnt fragments of human bones and teeth. One of the fire pits was a little bit bigger than the other. The bone fragments were collected 
and they were sent to the Smithsonian Institution to be analyzed. The Smithsonian said that one set of bones belonged to a woman who was between the ages of 18 and 22. The other set of bone fragments were from a girl who was between the ages of 6 and 8. The police quickly concluded that they had found the remains of Sandra Smalligan and Susie Yeager. Besides their burned remains being found in the same location, something else tied the murders together. A short time before Smalligan went missing, she had gone on a date with David Meyerhofer. After the date, Smalligan told her friends that she would never go on another date with Meyerhofer because he was too aggressive. Meyerhofer volunteered to take a polygraph exam and to be interrogated after taking sodium pentothal, which was thought to work like a truth serum. He passed the polygraph exam and he did confess after being injected with sodium pentothal. The local sheriff's office became convinced that Meyerhofer was innocent. The FBI profilers weren't as convinced. They were not surprised that Meyerhofer had volunteered to take the polygraph exam and to be injected with the sodium pentothal. In the profile that they constructed, they thought that the killer would try to interject himself into the investigation. The profilers also thought that Meyerhofer might confess if he was confronted by Susie's parents. Susie's parents agreed to meet with Meyerhofer, but Meyerhofer continued to deny having any involvement in Susie's murder. After the meeting, the FBI agents told Susie's parents to keep a tape recorder near their phone. They thought that Meyerhofer wasn't done talking to them. On June 25, 1975, which was the first anniversary of Susie's murder, the Yeager's phone in Farmington, Michigan started to ring. Susie's mother, Marietta, answered the phone. The caller said that his name was Mr. Travis. But Marietta knew precisely who was calling and said, Hello, David. The caller insisted on being called Mr. Travis. He told Marietta that he was the one who made the ransom phone calls in the days after Susie went missing. He also told Marietta something that wasn't public knowledge. He said that Susie had malformations on her index fingers. Marietta was able to keep the caller on the line for an hour. During their conversation, the caller broke down in tears. It turned out that Marietta had done what the FBI suggested and she recorded the conversation. She then handed the recording over to the FBI. It was compared to the recordings of the ransom calls that were made days after Susie went missing. The FBI agents noticed that there were similarities between the voices. A couple weeks after Marietta received the call, a rancher in Manhattan got in touch with the police and told them he had been charged for a phone call to Farmington, Michigan, which he didn't make. Agent Dunbar went to the ranch and discovered that the telephone line had been cut and used to make the call. When Meyerhofer was in the Marines, he was trained in communications, so he knew how to cut a phone line and use it to make a phone call. The FBI also learned that before it was abandoned, Meyerhofer had worked at the ranch where the remains were found. At the end of September 1975, the investigators thought that they had enough evidence to arrest Meyerhofer. He was taken into custody and his home was searched. As the FBI profilers predicted, Meyerhofer kept souvenirs. In his freezer were body parts from both victims. The police confronted Meyerhofer and he quickly broke down and confessed. 
He said that he had kidnapped Susie and took her to the ranch. Once there, she started fighting him and he ended up strangling her. He then said he kidnapped Sandra Smulligan from her apartment. He put some tape over her mouth and as he was carrying her out of the apartment, she suffocated to death. Meyerhofer then shocked the investigators by telling them that he wasn't done confessing. On March 19, 1967, just over six years before Susie was kidnapped, 13-year-old Bernard Pullman and a friend were climbing the supports of a bridge just outside of Manhattan. Meyerhofer, who was 16 years old, was hiding 150 feet away from them. He aimed his rifle at Bernard and fired. A 22 caliber bullet went through Bernard's heart and out of his body and he fell into the water. Meyerhofer couldn't explain why he killed Bernard. He said that he knew Bernard and he even liked him. 14 months after that, on May 5, 1968, Meyerhofer paid a visit to the same campground where he would kidnap Susie from five years later. That night, there was a group of Boy Scouts camping there. He cut a hole in the tent where 12-year-old Michael Rainey was sleeping. He stabbed Michael under his left arm and struck him in the head. Michael was discovered unconscious the next morning. Sadly, he died a short time later in the hospital. Meyerhofer said that after that, he served in the Marines for five years and then he returned to Manhattan just before Susie was kidnapped. Hours after Meyerhofer confessed, he was found dead in his jail cell. Meyerhofer, who was 25, had hanged himself with one of the jail's towels. David Meyerhofer was the first serial killer to be caught with the aid of offender profiling. Thanks a lot for watching today's video. Hopefully you found it interesting. If you did, please give us a thumbs up and subscribe for more videos just like it. Also, please go to criminallylisted.com where you can suggest cases, buy merch, and find out about an exclusive podcast. But that's all for today. Thank you so much for watching.